How many times would you start over? How many times would you be able to rebuild something you've spent years on only to have it demolished in front of you? How many cycles of build, destroy, build, destroy could you endure? And what if each cycle of destruction is carried out in a completely different way? Would you overcome each wave and maintain hope or give up? The life of a grower coming up through the 90s and early 2000s was absolutely no walk in the park. More like a walk that never ends. A walk where you could lose your life or your freedom. A walk that many give up on and few make it to the end unscathed. Welcome to High Design, my name is LMC. In this documentary, we are going to explore the turbulent yet inspiring story of Lance and his journey in building the Kraft Farmer brand. This is a story of perseverance, struggle, and passion. Make sure to hit the like button, share, subscribe, and strap in because this story is absolutely crazy. parents relocated to Mendocino in the early 70s. At that time, they had this vision of living off the land. There was kind of like this era of people wanting just a simpler life, getting away from the hustle and the bustle. They cut small redwood trees down by themselves without power tools and built this tiny little log cabin that my brother and I were born in. My, we were both born by candlelight in this, in this cabin without any running water or power and we lived like that for most of our childhood. Me and my brother grew up in the most amazing place in the world, I feel like. Like, we don't realize it, but we don't need anything. We don't need toys. You have the woods in your imagination. That is that is all you need. And so I contribute my life and my mind and the fantasizing and all of that stuff to my childhood. I remember the very first time I sold something weed related. I remember there was a, a kid named Junior in my middle school and he was talking about weed and he showed me a picture, you know, of like a, of a five fingered leaf. And he's like, you know, this is weed and like, you know, I'm trying to get some of this. And I was like, I've seen these plants before. Like I've got them in my backyard. And I remember when I was in the sixth grade, I snuck down there, I'll never forget it. I snuck down to my dad's garden in the morning. I remember snapping off one big five finger leaf plant. I put it in an R.L. Stein book that I had and I brought it to middle school and sold that leaf. And that was my very first time I sold anything cannabis. My high school had a graduating class of 45 people, I think. 20 of those kids I graduated pre-kindergarten with. Off-roading and trucks and wheeling, it was my fucking life from 15 to 18. I didn't drink alcohol, I didn't drink beer, I didn't smoke weed, but I wasn't square. Like, I, from a very young age, I know I wanted to make money and have some money, and my parents had split when I was really young. My mom was in Arizona. I basically packed all my stuff, picked up, and left for Arizona. Arizona was really where like shit started getting cracking for me. I was working at a, a welding shop. There was no minimum wage at the time, so I was getting paid like $5 an hour. My paychecks were like $225, I'll never forget. And I remember looking at that paycheck at 18 years old and thinking to myself like, how the fuck am I ever gonna make it in the world? Like, this is crazy. And you know, you start hanging out with the people that you, that you work with. There was a guy named Mikey and Mikey ran the press break. You know, and Mike, Mikey was really like the friendly one. He's like, hey man, you're new. Where are you from? What's your situation? Hey, do you want to come over to my house at lunch? You know, and come to find out, you know, Mikey burned nonstop. Like he's showing me all the places to burn while he's on the job. He's like, everyone here smokes in the bathroom. I'm like, what? We burn in the bathroom, we get high, we put our fucking face mask shields on, we go back to welding, you go can smoke here in the, the yard behind the shop. And I'm just like, this is crazy. Like I'm, I'm not doing this, you know? Probably like a month in, you know, Mikey's just telling me how like our job sucks and it's not fun and it's just like backbreaking labor and like weed just makes this whole thing fucking fun. And when you start smoking and we're high at work, like it's fun and it just makes everything better. And I mean, cannabis does, it makes every single situation, you know, better. Um, there's a there's a right time to use it and, and, a, and a time not to, but at that time, like, I'm, I'm just kind of following the lead. I mean, one thing led to another, you know, one minute 
you know, I'm smoking for the first time and then, and we're smoking ragweed, like shit you're breaking up, you know, with your fingers and stems and seeds and we're still getting ripped, you know, we're taking bong rips and smoking out of our pipe and smoking joints and like life's good. We're smiling and having fun and laughing and like it just opened me up to a, a totally different type of people and world and and I just started listening to, you know, like a lot of reggae music and smoking a lot of weed and and then, you know, started selling weed. My mom didn't know about it, so we'd have to get up every morning like we're going to work, she'd go to work. Me and my friend Warren would be back at the house playing foosball, selling weed out of her house. And I just knew that, you know, this wasn't gonna pan out for me. Like there's no money in Arizona. Everybody's broke down here and, and smoking dirt weed and that just wasn't gonna work out. I needed to do something else. Kind of like right at that time, you know, things started clicking where I was realizing like, man, you know, there's people around me that like I can get some shit from and I can bring shit down here and make some real money, you know, and that kind of led into, you know, moving home and, and started setting up a few uh, transportation situations that like brought me into the next point in my life. Mendo, Humble, Trinity. It wasn't like what everyone's come to know today that they see on IG with like these big gardens and big canopies. And it wasn't like that. You had to hide under the canopy or, or, or hide plants up in trees. Like seriously, hide plants in trees. Back then, like dude, these dudes who grew weed were fucking animals. You know, these guys are fucking in full camo attire, faces painted, getting dropped off like on the side of a hillside. There was a reason why that flower was 4,500 and 5,000 a pound for outdoor. There's only a few locations you could grow it and the insane fucking risk and challenges and work that these people did. I remember, you know, people were really into Keef back then because it was like another form of hash. And I'm learning to make it and like this man blessed me with like two fucking 55 gallon trash bags of like trim and littles. He's like, here Lance, you can have this. And so I got these bags and I ordered a uh, screen printing screen on eBay and I must have made 2,500 to 5,000 one gram bags of Keef. I'm just going through for like three days straight just making Keith non-stop and filling like these fucking dime bags till I had a duffel bag. I called the homies in Arizona and I'm like, yo, I'm getting on the road tomorrow. I'll be there in 16 hours. Whistle for the boys, like get everyone ready. I'm coming with the best shit that nobody's seen down there and everybody can afford it. Everybody's gonna be able to get a piece of this. This shit's gotta move, so I'm gonna bless all the homies at like 10, $15 a gram and then let them flip it. So I'm driving down there and I got my fucking headphones on listening to Cottonmouth Kings, just like, fuck yeah. Like I've got this duffel bag taking up the whole side of the, the bench seat. It's hot out, it's deserty. I'm fucking doing like 70. Just thinking to myself, like, I'm gonna cash the fuck out. Can't hear shit, cause I'm just fucking blaring Cottonmouth Kings. And I look down and I see my speed going down. I'm like, what the fuck? And like, I'm seeing all this smoke barreling from the rear view mirror, gray smoke. Pull the headphones out, hear a, a horrible sound, downshift, boom. That motherfucker's toast. So it just like comes rolling to a fucking stop. And like I get out and I look underneath it and the whole fucking transmission's cracked in half, just fucking guts all down the freeway. And I'm like, oh shit. And I got this duffel bag. I'm only like 15 minutes from Needles, passing through Needles, crossing the Arizona state border and entering Arizona. It was the most dangerous place to drive on the West Coast. And I'm like, all right, you know, it's just, you're going to see your mom, you know, you're on your way to press, get everything's fucking good. I got all my shit rehearsed. I know what's going on. I'm, I'm fine. I'm not all fucking high. I'm not smoking. I grab one of the phones that they got on the side of the freeway. I pick it up. I'm like, I've got a blown vehicle here. Yada, yada, yada. The tow truck's getting it. I start walking into town with the duffel pack on my back. I get into needles. I go to the liquor store, use the pay phone. I call my two homies at the time. And I'm like, yo, I'm in fucking needles. Come get me now. This was 2002. As I'm sitting there, I got my fucking duffel bag here. I'm just sitting. The CHP officer like just pulls right up to the liquor store where he gets out of his car. He comes walking up and he looks down at me and he's like, hey man, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, my truck broke down up the road, going to see my mom in Arizona. You know, she's on her way to pick me up. And he was like, okay, right on, you know, glad to see you got it covered. And he goes into that 
fucking liquor store and leaves. I didn't even bring a t-shirt with me. Little did he know that fucking duffel bag was loaded up to the gills. And the boys rolled up and I grabbed the duffel bag and we jumped in his fucking lowered 1992 Honda Accord four-doored and stepped on the gas and headed right for fucking Prescott. My intention was never to go there and pillage the wallets of like all my young peers and all the strugglers. When I saw the weed that they had and what they were smoking, like this whole thing like wasn't just about money. The mentality and the mindset is about like the people. I fucking blew through that duffel bag in like three days. It was gone. Once this machine started, like it never stopped. I mean, it just carried me into my adult life. I remember getting this badass house and it was just like a, a dream for us. Warren, who I brought with me from Arizona for a better life, my childhood friend, Steven. Warren came to me one day and he's like, my cousin from Arizona wants to come up from Prescott where we were and he wants to grab six pounds and make 600 bucks. I remember going up to the coast and finding the work that we needed through a family friend, securing them, bringing them back to my house. To me, like it just seemed like I was gonna make this money and pay this person and you know it, it is what it is I didn't think anything of it they ended up showing up at like two in the morning or something here's my house here's where it happened this fucking dude was parked just like this right here right fucking here I vividly remember my feeling in my stomach and I remember opening the front door the figure of this person I'd never met was standing there this white kid um, he had NorCal tattoos like on his, on the four, forearms. And I had that container of weed and you know, like in my hands, this little thing. And he's like, hey, we got your money out here in the car. I remember going out there and he directed me to the passenger side of the vehicle. He's like, hey, you can throw the, you know, throw this container in the back of the car. We got your money in the front. I looked down there and there's a money bag, you know, from the bank with the zipper. And I unzipped it and I looked in and there was all this white paper that was cut to the size of money. And I remember like, like looking at that and just thinking like, oh fuck, this shit's about to get real and real fast. And I just so happened to look up, the dude's got a fucking gun in my face. I'm kind of in, in shock from just seeing the, the fake money to seeing this, to the, all this shit happening. And he was telling me to get out of the car. And I said, I'm not getting out of the fucking car. Like I'm not leaving here without my weed. Like this isn't happening. And I just remember telling him, you know, I was like, I'm gonna count to 10 and I'm gonna fucking start screaming bloody murder. We're in the middle of a suburban neighborhood and it's 3 a.m. and these dudes are trying to fucking rob me at gunpoint. I jumped, like I was sitting in the seat like this and I lunged across the driver to get out of the car. And right then and there, like the dude just reached down and like unloaded a clip into the car onto me. It was literally like pop, 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 pop. Broken glass, container, house. Mike, I jumped across the driver. He unloaded. I got to the other side, crawled, you know, dove, crawled up from the street. There was like this super look of fear in his eyes. Like, he just unloaded a motherfucking clip into me and I was coming right at him. Dude, I, I, I was so fucking furious because I'm like, how dare this motherfucker. I swung on him, connected him, he went down, grabbed my bin, and as I'm trying to make it back to my fucking house, that's when I'm starting to like have some issues with my stability and being able to stand on my legs and just like literally kind of just falling over the concrete. Got into the, you know, the bathroom and, and climbed my fucking ass into the tub and, and just from there I just started losing like my strength and my vision and, and breathing was getting harder. My childhood friend Steven uh, came into the bathroom, grabbed me, scooped me up, carried me, carried me to the car and drove me to the hospital. I mean, I was upstairs for 10, 15 minutes before we left the house, before, they, before Steven picked me up and carried me down the stairs. I mean, at this point, it's just like all setting in and I'm processing and then right away, there's two detectives in my face and they're like, what happened? Like, you know, what was going on? And I made some crazy fucking story up about two people fighting in the street at 2.30 a.m. and woke me up and I tried to go out there and, and fucking, you know, stop them. And I ended up getting fucking just shot up like in between them. And, you know, they just saw, saw fucking right through that. And it was like, dude, like we're hitting your house right now. There's blood all over the inside of your house. There's weed in your house, there's scales like, that's when it like all just like fucking 
hit me that like all night I've been lying to myself and lying about the situation and telling myself over and over like I'm gonna get through it, then I'm shot, then I'm gonna get through it, then I'm bleeding, then I'm gonna... I kept fucking making up excuses like you're just like making up ways you're gonna get through this, you're telling yourself all that shit and like when when they called me out on that shit and I was in that hospital and like that's when like the fucking train hit me that like oh fuck the cat's out there. I'm heavily sedated. I've got fucking eight open wounds below my waist, thank God. Nothing has hit my fucking spine. Nothing hit an artery. Nothing hit like a hip. You know, like I, I've been hit all these times, but through x rays and shit, they're like, dude, you're very lucky. The leg's shattered, but it's, but there hasn't been like any devastating destruction done internally that we can see. I remember seeing my parents. I remember seeing my brother and I remember like right at that time they brought my lawyer in and um, I think at that point like right around right around there um, he had told me that like I need to cooperate because I'm in some serious trouble they know that this was a drug deal gone bad neighbors had called saying you know they heard shots fired they found the blood trail from the side of the fucking curb to the fucking house, found the weed, and these dudes tried to come fucking kill me over six pounds, and, and I was the fool if I didn't cooperate. I remember being really fucking drugged out, really fucking overwhelmed. My parents were, <laughs> were scared. I mean, I couldn't even imagine what a parent would feel like. You have a kid that is been shot a bunch of times he's he's in the fucking hospital like yeah i mean you're you're giving your thanks and you're counting your blessings and shit but you know like my dad was really hard i just couldn't imagine what he was feeling you know like scared and sad disbelief like i i just i can't imagine like i was too busy trying to like fucking deal with my own shit like dude i was fucking drugged up heavily and sedated and i'm like who the fuck even did this to me like, I saw this dude's face one time when I opened the fucking front door. I saw this dude for the first time in my life, and then a minute and a half later, two minutes later, he's fucking shooting me. I told him the truth. They're like, dude, look, you're you're on your own charges. You took your weed back. We're charging you with, with intent to distribute, with possession, all this shit. They were just basically, I remember telling me, like, you know, like, this isn't a rat situation. These dudes came to fucking murder you. You fought back, you got your weed back, you're catching these charges like you can't, we can't let these guys go away for some, some pussy shit like this. And I remember trying my fucking hardest to describe them and, and describe the fucking car. All I remember was that it was a fucking Acura Integra because I put my hand through the headrest, those, those Acura Integras, those 1992 Integras, the, the headrests were fucking open and, and I put my fucking forearm through a fucking glass hatchback. It had to be an Acura Integra. So I'm like, dude, these guys came in an Acura Integra, three white kids, the driver was fat, right? It shouldn't be that hard. Boom, within like three hours, there's a fucking Acura Integra in Nevada at a gas station with the back window shattered. A fucking sheriff officer spots it while he's fueling up and there's fucking blood all over the inside of the car. The three dudes were inside buying shit at the liquor store and they came out. They operated a, a tra you know, a stop on him. There was blood all over the inside of the car. They had the firearm. They had two other firearms. They had a nine millimeter and a 45 in that car. And if I would have hit, been hit with either one of those guns, I would have been fucking wiped out on the spot. They would have drugged my dead body out of that car. The next thing that happens is, this is 2001, they come into my fucking room. My legs are all up in the air, they're all bandaged. I'm all on fucking painkillers, just don't even like have the energy to process it. You're just kind of like laying there like a fucking, just broken. And they brought in like five pages of this fucked up scan document and there's like 16 fucking mug shots on on each page and they're like we need you to identify the three fucking people that shot you and i remember like at first looking at this fucking page and being like dude i've never seen these guys at any point in my fucking life all these fucking dudes look the same and by the grace of god i picked out three out of 44 mug shots they said they had a fucking guardian angel 
looking over me that night. I'm in the hospital for three days. I remember at that time leaving the hospital in a wheelchair. All of these wounds that were open were gonna have to heal from the outside in, so they weren't gonna stitch them up. It was like a month in the wheelchair, dealing with the wounds, and then getting into a cast, and I didn't work at that time. Like, I just had to take care of my legs, basically, and and work on that healing process. And so one of my takeaways is you can't put yourself in a situation where that can happen to you. You need to think about everything and what happens the most in challenging times is disparity and poor decision making. You need to burn your fucking weed before you start doing shady things and meeting shady fucking people. So I got out of the hospital. My parents are fucking really worried and scared and my brother's in high school. And just that whole situation was bad and like not good for the whole fucking family and dealing with rumors and people saying things and talking about you. And I brought a, a bunch of shit to my family's doorstep that was unnecessary and, and worry and doubt. And I think at that point, you know, it was probably, I think it was decided like it wasn't best if I was like, I don't exactly remember what the situation was, but I remember having to go back to the fucking house like three days after I was shot, like back to the house that I was shot in and like live there basically alone. The roommates left, the forensics left, the blood was all over the carpet. Like I went back into the house that I got shot in and lived there for two weeks or, or something like that. I had my dream truck. I had a 1994 Toyota Extra Cab with two fucking 12s in a ported box with glass, plexiglass window in the back that I built and making money and selling weed and, and working a full-time job. Like my shit was sick as fuck. This new house, like I was on top of the world. When I came out of the fucking hospital, like my dad had sold my shit, all my stuff was gone. My truck was gone, he sold it. You know, I think he sold my truck for eight grand so he could pay my fucking lawyer. The roommates got charged too. Their charges ended up uh, getting dropped. A lot of people out there that, that when that happens, they're never selling a single thing yeah. again, bro. Bro, mean? all I could think about laying in the bed is like, I need to get my sacks on. Yeah. Like I, I was like, man, I need, a, I need a new plug. I need to get some weed as soon as I get out of here. Like I need to start. And dude, you know what? That's so easier said than done. Yeah. You just got gunned the fuck down. You're in a wheelchair. No one wants to fuck with you. I just knew I needed to get to work. I needed to get back on the grind. I needed to start selling weed again. Like all these things were just fucking itching me and driving me nuts. And it had been only two months since I got shot. I'm like, I'm going back to the body shop. And I just randomly went back to the body shop. My legs were fucked. You know, still at this point they were shattered. My wounds were open, but <laughs> I remember wrapping my legs in my cast, super tight, fucking ace bandages. I had supports on, I put pants on, and I fucking drove back to the body shop. I remember I had to climb this long flight of stairs basically to get up to Jim Randolph's office who owned the body shop. He had been there for, you know, like 30, 40 years or something, and I went right back into his office and knocked on his door. He said, come in. I went in there and I sat down in front of his desk and I asked him for my job back. I told him I could start tomorrow. There's nothing wrong with me. Please don't ask. I promise that I'll be a better employee than, than the great employee you had before and, and I can't take no for an answer. I need to fucking do something. I need to start working. I need, I need this for my own personal mental rehabilitation. And he gave me my job back. And I started working the next day at the body shop and, and I would sneak off to the bathroom every time I could and change my leg bandages and spray fucking Lysol and, and, and Febreze into my pants so they didn't fucking, so I didn't smell because I, I, did, I, had, I had fucking all these open wounds that just like, the smell was like a fucking dead body. Like you just couldn't, you couldn't mask that smell. So I just would constantly change bandages, fucking put air fresher in my pockets and I went right back to work. I remember thinking to myself like every day, like, like I'm, I'm healing my fucking body. Like I remember going to work and walking all over the body shop and sweeping and my fucking mindset was like healing, healing. Like I fucking pictured myself like, pictured my body healing itself. Like as crazy as that sounds, like I pictured my fucking 
my wounds healing and I'm walking and they told me I can't walk and it's not good and I did everything they said that I shouldn't do and um, I was going over to custom car audio all the time every day after work I wanted to work there so bad I was huge into car audio customizing cars building boxes any everything in my fucking life that I've ever done I've ever wanted there was no position I created it whatever I wanted to do I go out and get it done like I wanted to work at that car stereo shop. They weren't hiring, there was no position. I went there every day after work. I hung out till fucking 10.30. I slept in my fucking car. I didn't have a place to live at that time. I slept in my car in Santa Rosa. I didn't have anywhere to go. So I'd go to fucking custom car audio, you know, and I'd hung out there from like, dude, those dudes worked late, like midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. The car audio world was different. I would just hang out there and hand them parts and I was learning shit. And before you knew it, I just fucking created this, this position for myself. Four months after I got shot, two months after I went back to work at Lucer, I had my fucking dream job at Custom Car Audio. I fucking loved working at the stereo shop. The stereo shop was the most amazing job I had ever had. Like, first of all, like when I started there, you know, I'm 20, I'm meeting these new people, my boss. These dudes were fucking insane, dude. I landed the most fucking amazing job in, in the world. I manifested this job for four years. When I got the job at Custom Car Audio, like looking back at that now, like I never worked another job in my life. I was 20 years old and never again in my life did I ever do anything that I did not like ever again. And that's fucking unreal. I'm so fucking grateful for that job because Scott Babson and Rich Clark and Chris Bishop and these people, Mike Thurman, these people that I worked with were perfectionists. I'll never forget it when they used to zip tie fucking lines of cable, like the zip tie went the same way with the head perfectly and they were placed every 10, shit you'd never see. And so these people that fucking taught me, I was so young in, 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 and so fresh, like I was at just the perfect age for them to mold me and have a, a heavy impact on my life. Like, dude, I say it all the time, like my professionalism and my perfection and the reason my shit looks perfect from my canopies to my fucking work, to my building, to everything I do in life, to the cleanliness of my fucking shop is because of my dad and custom car audio. My dad was a fucking anal motherfucker. Anal, light switched, don't waste electricity, want this clean, organized, put away, like, just amazing. Amazing that, that I had that fucking stern upbringing because it created the fucking animal I am today. So, I mean, at this point, I'm 22 years old. I'm selling weed. I've had this ambition now for like, a year or two years, like, I'm gonna grow weed. This has been on my radar for years, but like, how am I gonna grow weed in some fucking rental and get busted and like, fuck that. Like, I'm not doing anything to jeopardize my success and where I'm doing and all this stuff. So I remember just saving money and, and selling weed and I was stacking cash and I had a customer, this really good customer. He came in to see me and we were talking. He's like, Lance, you know, you need to buy a house. You know, that's the next best move for you. And I'm all about it. I'm like, yeah, please. And he introduced me to his girlfriend, this amazing woman who was working for Bank of America. I ended up getting my loan and buying my first house. I needed a house. This was right before the big fucking bubble and they were giving houses away basically on stated income. Dude, I got creative. Let's just say that. Like I got very creative and did shit that nobody would ever fucking do. And I got a full dock loan. With the help of a lot of fucking people and the help of fucking bosses with that had fucking stamp, we had stamps at work with people's signatures and let's just say I did whatever the fuck it took and provided any fucking document necessary and did whatever the fuck I had to do to get that house and I got that fucking house. The first thing I did, I bought the house, I got a U-Haul and I went straight to fucking San Diego to get my brother out of college and move him in with me in Santa Rosa. So I'm 23 and he's 19. He's 19 turning 20. He just did two years at San Diego State University. Bro, we moved into a brand new house in the country in Santa Rosa and 
I maybe kept my job for another six months. We were blowing grape swishers every day, listening to fucking reggae music at the at as loud as the speakers would play, blowing it out the windows, out the doors. Our fucking best friends had the had the band Revolution, which is fucking huge now. They were just coming up in Isla Vista, so they were they were coming up to Santa Rosa and doing shows, and we were having house parties and. And I'm 24 years old with four lights in my fucking house, smoking tree all fucking day, selling weed, just living on top of the fucking world. You gotta remember too, I only had four lights. I'm only growing, we're only talking four and a half pounds, you know, but like even back then, you know, even grow four pounds, sell it for $3,000, that's only 12 grand. My house was 2,500 a month, the power was 1,500 a month. Like I was living fucking dollar to dollar. And I just remember like, I'd sell it and I'd have 12 grand and that 12 grand just got me to the next harvest and then sold that. And I just remember thinking like, I need to fucking expand. So my four lights at my house turned into fucking a six light room, which turned into a 12 light room. And then before you knew it, I got 12 lights in the garage. I'm, I'm 26 years old. Don't have fucking much, but I've got a fucking house and I've got to grow and I'm a fucking free man and that's all that matters. Every single person thinks they're gonna start their own business and they're gonna do really good. And so I start my own business called Audio Legends and go get my license and all my shit and I'm growing during the day and I've got this little fucking hole in the wall, little bay that I'm renting at a smog shop and it's a fucking joke, it's a front. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm growing at my house, I've got this little stereo hustle. It's not even making me fucking $6,000 a month. And then one day I get a call from Jim Haig and Jim Haig had bought Tim Stone Audio, which is a stereo shop on the north part of Santa Rosa. He took this location, started Redwood Audio and Video. He called me and was like, hey, look, I'm leaving this shop. Do you want to take it over? You can have this location. It's been a, a stereo shop for 30 fucking years. It'll be a really good location for you if you want it and, and you're trying to do this and I will shoe you in and make this happen for you. So like, I'm like, holy shit, like, wow, I'm gonna get my own shop and and this could be something and, and like this was a huge possibility. So I fucking took it and I moved into that location. It was $2,000 a month. I think 2,400 square feet or something had a little showroom. Like I'm gonna grow weed, weed and make that shit on the side, but like I do stereo work. Like I'm in the stereo business. So like I'm gonna fucking run with the shop. I've got audio legends and I've got my own little store and I'm gonna try to fucking make it, you know? But over like that next year, I just realized like, fuck this. Like I don't wanna be some stereo bitch like putting in fucking speakers and shit fails and you're doing all this free work and just, I didn't like it. I'm like, I like doing it for myself and not for everyone else. And I knew really quickly, like these four lights here have to turn into a lot more. And so at that shop, the four lights turned into fucking 10 lights, the 10 lights turn into 20 lights. And then I just did like a full on remodel one day where I stripped everything down. I put up this fucking false wall. Like at this point I'm building shit, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to build the baddest fucking grow room I've ever had. Here we are, 957. This was my spot right here. This shop. Pull up to this door every day, right here. This was it. This is, this is where it really went down for me. This spot changed me. This spot changed my life. Because when, when things happen for you, then you start realizing you can do other things and you're capable of more. This was my this was my first fucking fake business. I'm like, oh, this is great. I've got a story. You know, I had a fucking place where my shop, you come in and my cars and my motorcycles and my fucking shit. Like, dude, this was sick. I think I had my little stereo store in here and my displays and my speakers and the shop. And so dude, check this out. I did a complete false wall in the back of the building and brought the whole building forward seven feet and went all the way to the roof. So when you look, the whole back was a grow room. My rooms back then were pristine. I built the baddest, cleanest fucking grow rooms you'd see. I geeked out of that. Like, remember I came right from car audio 
into growing, into growing and building these grow rooms and I treated them like a car. Zip tied all my wires, fucking perfect. Like I built the dopest fucking grow room that anyone had at the time. I ran my stereo business. I had a sliding bookshelf with all my cables and tools and glue and all that shit that hid the opening and now I'm starting to get into crush mode. I've got my house hitting. My house has 12 lights in it. I'm hitting fucking 24 pounds out of the house like clockwork, you know, every three months. I've got the shop now with 20 lights there. I'm getting 40 pounds out of the fucking shop. Like, now I'm starting to stack fucking cash. The shop's thumping, my house is thumping. I kept my life extremely private. I kept it, you know, my brother knew about my life and my parents, but other than that, even like my best friends at the time, like I didn't let nobody know anything. I didn't do any business with them. I kept my shit very fucking private. And so I remember getting this building where I'm sitting right here today, this shop. I meet the landlord, it's this wide open, just fucking empty building. And he's like, well, what are you doing in here? Like, what's gonna go on? And, and I'm like, well, I've got this, this car stereo shop on the other side of town and it's very successful. And, and you know, I just need to expand and, and I'm gonna do home theater. Oh, okay, okay. And, and I'm telling him all this shit. And he's like, okay, well, the building's yours and we do all the shit and I start building. Dude, at this point, I'm building grow rooms. Like any building I get, I'm putting grow rooms in. And so I start building that grow room back there and I'm just like, fuck, dude. Like I can't just build a grow room. Like how am I gonna hide this fucking grow room from my landlord and all my neighbors and everything? And I'm literally, I remember, like it was as if it was yesterday. I'm fucking sitting right here where I am today on this old fucking love seat that we had moved, that my mom and dad had given me that went into my house, that then out of my house to the shop and I'm sitting here and I'm taking a fucking bong rip and I'm sitting in my new fucking shop and I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? And and I'm stoned and I remember going and fucking painting with a, with a can of spray paint, a fucking box on the wall and I'm sitting right where I am today in this empty shop in this fucking love seat and, and I'm like, oh, I should build a fucking movie theater. Like if I build this movie theater here, it'll look legit. I told the landlord I'm fucking, you know, I'm in the home theater business and I can hide the fucking 16 light grow room I'm building in the back. What a fucking great idea. Genius! I'm a fucking genius and I'm gonna build the baddest fucking movie theater anyone's ever happened. There's no fucking reason anyone will doubt, <laughs> doubt what I'm doing. I was building a movie theater. Like I went and told them all like, Man, I'm, I'm Lance, I'm building a fucking movie theater here. I'm gonna bring my high high dollar clients here. I'm gonna demo it for them. And dude, people saw what I was doing and had fucking absolutely no reason to question me. But dude, I remember selling my weed for $1,800 back then when people are getting 28, but like I would dump 40, 50 pounds at a time and it was so much money to me. Like I just wanted to turn and burn and keep moving. And, and that was the approach I took. So I'm cranking and at this point, like I don't really have employees. I'm fucking, cranking on every spot, I'm doing all the work, I'm going there, I'm checking. Back then we were flooding drains, so I'm changing my water. The, the only time that I did have people come help is when it came time to trim. The first time I ever took a vacation, I went to Mexico for like five or seven days. The second time I took a vacation, I got raided while I was on vacation. <laughs> You're, we were only talking fucking 20 lights in here, 12 lights at my house, 16 lights at the shop, like it's not a lot. So like, I don't have foot traffic. I'm doing work every day. I'm trying to live the front. Like I didn't look, the, I didn't look the part. I didn't play the part. I didn't smell the part. And they just showed up one day. There was like 50 fucking cops. The feds came in full fucking FBI thing. They had a fucking rig out here. Some semi rig with chains hooked up to the door and they were trying to get the door open. It was a fucking, it was a mess. I mean, I don't even know if they were on my radar. It just seemed like literally I just got hit and they raided me. And then like when all the information came out and the search warrants and it was just weird. I remember in the police report, they showed up on a fucking Saturday on Valentine's Day at 8 a.m. They said they cased the building for an hour. There was no movement and that told them that it was like a fake business or some shit. It was just really weird how it all went down. So like. When I read that and then look at what happened and, and all the shit, like 
I think someone fucking narked on me because there's there's no way they just show up one day, do one hour of surveillance, and then fucking hit all your spots with a big old warrant. So 2013, and I was in Jamaica, and I remember I was there with a very good friend of mine, and uh, he came to my room, knocked on the door. I remember I answered the door, and I stepped outside, and he handed me his phone, and on his phone was the front page of the Press Democrat talking about how I'd been raided. I just remember coming back and landing in San Francisco and calling my lawyer and and he was like, you know, there's no warrant out for your arrest, so we'll turn your we'll turn you in on Monday morning. And so the first thing I did was I drove to my shop and the shop was just fucking annihilated. Like the whole front of the building was destroyed. When you get raided, it looks like you had the fucking nastiest robbery happen where people didn't give a fuck about your shit at all, destroy your shit, break your things. Full SWAT was at my house with an arrest warrant. You know, obviously I knew it was coming, so it was pretty smooth, you know? So I'm arrested at that point, and I think they're taking me to jail, and I'm waiting for them to take me down to jail, and I just realized, I'm like, wait, so they're not, they're not taking me down to jail. They took me to directly right to the fucking police station and put me inside of a interrogation room. This was the first time that I met the fucking pit bull detective on this case. And, you know, he came in and just had a lot of questions and I was just right from the gate, you know, I was like, look, I mean, no disrespect, but I'm not answering shit. In the beginning, it wasn't so bad. You know, I'm like thinking, okay, man, I got charged with cultivation, but really what I'm thinking is like, what the fuck am I gonna do? Like, all I know is cannabis and, and weed, and I've been doing this since I was fucking 18, and, and I've already pressed the reset button once and started right back up again, and, and it just didn't seem like I could start up again. You know, like, I got these dudes breathing down my neck, like, I mean, they're coming to my house, they're fucking, it's almost as if I'm getting raided over and over again, because at that point I'm on felony probation, and even though I haven't been charged, I'm still put on felony probation, so, Anytime they want to come and search my house, my vehicles, anything like that, they can apprehend me. When this gang's fucking with you, nothing's safe. There's no hours of the day. You can't lock the door. You have no protection. They do whatever the fuck they want. This whole process was just weird. Like I went into the, the shop and it's all torn apart and went into the movie theater and there's like straws and, and fucking uh, like Coke baggies on the counter and, and those test kits. And I'm like fucking tripping. I'm like, oh my God, they're planning drugs on me. They're gonna get me on this other shit. I was just, I was so out of my mind at the time. I was convinced. Like when you start getting into those bad areas, you start thinking some fucked up shit's happened to you, dude. Matt, you don't even need to be on drugs and you're paranoid as a motherfucker, dude. And I'm thinking they're, they're doing all kinds of shady shit to me. And so I went to court fucking like five days later and then they re-arrested me and charged me with all kinds of new charges and told the judge that they wanted these charges separated from the other ones so I would have to spend more lawyer costs, I would have to fight multiple cases and I would have to go to court more often. So they were fucking with me pretty good from the beginning. And at this point I'm thinking it can't get any worse. Can't get any worse at this point. Fucking a month goes by, a month and a half goes by and it's like 6.30 in the evening and I go out and check my mail and there's like this huge packet from like the Sonoma County um, District Attorney's Office and I open that fucking packet and I'm being indicted on, on 56 counts of felony money laundering, which are all stackable offenses and I'm looking at like fucking 12 years in prison. I was, I was fucking scared, I was angry. I fucking called my lawyer's office extremely angry. Why didn't you guys tell me? They didn't even know about it. Like, I was literally in court. I've already been indicted. I've already faced my charges. I've already post bail. Like, you should have seen when this happened. Like, everybody was like, what the fuck's going on? Like, literally, it was so weird. I was standing there and all of a sudden, literally out of nowhere, like, I got grabbed standing there at the podium and fucking re-arrested. 
My lawyer had never seen it in his 40 years of practicing. It was a really weird situation and I got re-arrested, put back into jail, had to post another fucking bond. The deal that they're offering me is take the full charges and do, I think they're at, they're telling me to do 10 years in San Quentin. I mean, I got busted. Like, it's not like there's no evidence that I was doing this, but normally they'll offer you a decent offer where it's much less than if they take you to trial and convict you. But my situation, they weren't offering me any deal. They were just saying like, you can take the full, the full charges. So I'm like, well, there's no deal on the table. I'm going to trial. Like, um, we fought that and we fought it and we fought it. And man, we had a judge one day throw out like, a judge one day threw, threw out 42 of those money laundering charges. And that was a massive fucking victory for us. Massive. I'll do this deal right now. I want my truck back. I want my rock crawler. I want my money that you took out of my retirement accounts. And I'll do three months probation after I serve my, my time. And then if I don't get in trouble during that time, it goes to a misdemeanor. And they, and they took, they took, they took it and I signed that deal. I went through all of that and completed it, um, got my uh, felony turned into a misdemeanor and then had that misdemeanor expunged. So as many L's as I've taken in, in all these losses, like I've had huge blessings. So like looking back is as bad as everything was, as bad as things were, I also had these monumental wins. So like my life was definitely this yin and yang, but I was like living, I was like tightrope walking on the dollar. You know what I'm saying? Like I barely had enough to get through this shit. Rooms are harvesting indoor that are like paying for other shit. It was just like a fucking total like Rob Peter, uh, pay Paul kind of fucking situation. You know, it was, um, it was hard and challenging at the same time. Just, yeah, like it just seemed like, like I was, I was <laughs> losing, but like always just on the verge of like almost losing everything, but like just barely able to like keep it together. You don't realize it at that time, but like I was building the fucking man that I am today. You know what I'm saying? I was learning all the information then to be able to get myself into a position to help people now. Everybody has it in them. It's just whether or not some of some of us can fucking go unlock that door. Our in my mind, our mind and our brain is like a fucking uh, a video game that like when you hit certain levels, doors open for you. Doors were starting to open as Lance concluded his legal case. And the next year or two of probation, Lance would secretly be consulting and prepping his return to Prop 215 and the rapidly approaching incoming legal market. From 2015 to 2017, Lance would have such bad luck to where multiple times in different ways, he lost all the progress that he made. Whether it was a former business partner who stole his entire harvest, or the next year where a massive windstorm completely destroyed his grow, or that one time where a forest fire destroyed one of his other grows. Anyways, there are plenty of other setbacks that Lance would have to deal with during this time but this video would be two to three hours long if we listed them all out. So for time's sake, just know there were many insane losses and setbacks Lance had to endure. Around 2016 to 2017, Lance would start to sell his flower to a company called Mercy Wellness. He was a vendor there for a year and a half. Now the thing about Mercy Wellness is they would never really let their vendors package and brand the flower that they would sell to Mercy Wellness. But in 2018, because Lance's flower was such high quality, he would convince Brandon, the owner of Mercy Wellness, to allow him to start packaging and selling his own brand in the store, which was called Red Tail Farms. Lance would package four gram eighths of top shelf and the brand started to do really well in the Mercy Wellness store. Brandon was actually so impressed by Lance and the quality of the flower he was producing that he would ask Lance about potentially working together. Starting in 2019, Lance would actually get a job designing and running Mercy Wellness cultivation operations. We're back in the Mercy Wellness factory pumping out your craft 
fire indoor from the original Sonoma County Crusher. During this time, Lance would really start to gain more of a following online on social media. And we can do it on a Tuesday night because we push it. We push it hard. We push in that legal Prop 64 way. And it lead a top shot. Cut the check. Lance's Instagram story views would start to get higher and higher due to Lance showing off the facilities he had designed and was managing for Mercy Wellness. And a little after that happened, Lance would change his brand name to what we know now as Craft Farmer. Daily life as the underground king in the tropical forest in here. In case you didn't know, this is the Mercy Wellness flower factory, We're reloading room number four right now, putting all those small plants uh, from our bedroom that I showed you. Slabs are getting ready to uh, go While in Lance here. was doing his job at a very high level, Brandon wasn't liking that Lance was getting so much attention. And later that year, Lance would get a consulting job from the owner of Mango Tech to go and consult a cannabis company up in Seattle. The consulting job in Seattle went great and Lance would start to do more and more consulting for cannabis companies around the country. But Brandon was starting to push Lance to sign an NDA. So he wouldn't be able to consult other companies and obviously Lance refused to sign it. If you know about Lance and or you've seen any of the content he's done, you most likely have heard him say the phrase, cut the check or cut the fucking check. This term cut the check was a phrase that Lance started to use right when he began working at Mercy Wellness because he knew he was designing and running the facility at such a high level. But when Brandon threatened to stop paying Lance his bonus structure because he wouldn't sign the contract, Lance would slightly repurpose the term cut the check to lightly troll Brandon. Now the standoff between Brandon and Lance would go on for about a year or so with Lance refusing to sign the contract, but would continue to work at Mercy. See, you have to understand that Lance and his brother were crushing it for Mercy Wellness, and Brandon needed them. So the standoff would last a decent amount of time, during which Lance's cut the check term began to build a life of its own. Make sure you put six zeros behind our name and cut the check! What's up, big dog, Lance? It's your boy, O-Dog, here with my friend Luke. He wanted me to uh, give you a message. He came to visit, and he fucking brought those hunteds. He was hoping to see the craft farmer today, but uh, he's out of town, so we'll have to get it next time. Bring hunteds. Welcome to Cut the Check with Craft Farmer, the Grow Gorilla, bringing out the best in you, building big bank accounts, big bags of money. I'm gonna make you the canopy king in your circle, the drip irrigation specialist. Listen in as we bring you the best guests and the most entertainment. With people all around the industry now yelling, Cut the Check, it potentially seemed like this annoyed Brandon, but we can't know for sure. Cut the cheese! The tension between Lance and Brandon would continue to build with Lance's online craft farmer store that he started back in 2019 starting to get a lot of traction. See back in 2019, Lance would just start selling hats for the craft farmer brand. And then later that year, while designing the irrigation system for Mercy Wellness, he would call this product the Whip Kit. Once he put this product on his online store, just in the first few days, it would sell around $62,000 worth of whip kits. By the second month, Lance was selling over $280,000 worth of whip kits. This success seemed to bother Brandon and the sales for the whip kits would continue to get higher and higher as time would go on. Similar to the pressure building in that of the relationship between Brandon and Lance. And in August of 2020, Lance would officially leave Mercy Wellness to focus on building Craft Farmer. 
In general, when it comes to the industry, the relationship between a head grower and the corporate higher ups can very commonly result in this scenario. What we have to give credit to Lance for is holding out and not signing a non-compete NDA. Who knows if Lance would be where he is today if he had signed it. What is Kraft Farmer and what does it represent? Kraft Farmer to me represents the pursuit of being the very best that you can be at whatever it is. So for me, my life has been cultivation, growing the best medicine that I possibly can, continuing on that journey of learning, just constant evolution of becoming a better cultivator, a better leader, a better helper, a better you know part of the larger team that I consider Kraft Farmer, all my customers, how can I support them better? So for me, when you say the word Kraft Farmer, it's just being the best of your ability, never striving for less and never accepting less, like always trying to be a better version of yourself and setting the bar high. Man, when I come in here, I'm just motivated on a whole motherfucking new level to pack orders, to see what people are buying. Let's go check our order list, see what kind of invoices the wife has for us today. Boom, four three quarter inch powered whip kit, son. Coming right out to Shannon, it's on the way. We got the Mango Tech Store with some replacement valves. In April of 2021, Lance would convince Alex, the owner of Mango Tech, who I mentioned earlier, to start selling his whip kits in the Mango Tech Store, which then, in turn, helped sales increase massively. Later in 2021, Lance would start to consult companies around the country while also consulting growers of all sizes. Utilizing Patreon as a platform to get paid for consulting, charging anywhere from $250 for 30 minutes to $500 for an hour. Welcome to the Craft Farmer Patreon, where we teach you everything you need to know around cultivation, irrigation, room parameters, and everything else. It's the only thing that you need to sign up for to grow like the pros. I'm bringing out the very best cultivator in you and teaching you everything that's taken me a lifetime to learn. From cloning, to having the perfect veg, to execution in flower. Sign up now, don't hold back. Bring out the very best cultivator in you. It'll be the best investment that you've ever made. When we look at the Kraft Farmer brand and its business avenues it's currently ingrained in, we can see that much of the brand focuses on helping growers of all shapes and sizes succeed. Whether that be through the educational content or through supplying growing tech and more. I want to pray to the grow gods that this customer absolutely gets blessed, blessed with big yields, big trichomes, big bank accounts, big relationships. Let this fucking whip kit change this customer's life. Let the grow gods bless this box. Hallelujah. In 2022, the Kraft Farmer store has been doing some amazing numbers. In March, the store did $667,000. In April, the store did $542,000. And in May, the store did around $1.1 million. And starting this month, we're going to be seeing Lance and Kraft Farmer launch the High Society Social Club, where every three months, there will be a members only event where you'll receive never released before genetics. So I'm excited to see how that develops. And I think it's a really interesting idea. Now, something that has me excited for the future is that Lance has partnered up with one of my favorite people, David Polly, the owner of Preferred Gardens. You might have seen the high design documentary I did on him, but I highly recommend you go check that out if you haven't. I'm really excited about today. This has been a long time in the making. We're heading to the state-of-the-art greenhouse facility ran by my boy David at Preferred Gardens. David is the fucking absolute goat. All the fire he's been pumping out, that dude is a fucking workhorse and we're excited to go see him and blessed to have him in our life. We knew each other before we knew each other. The fact that David and Lance are partnering up, I think it's pretty amazing. And both are extremely talented, knowledgeable growers. And they must have an immense amount of respect for each other because knowing David and Lance, these are both two people that I've talked to specifically about how 
they are really, really cautious about getting into any sort of partnership with anyone. So this partnership in Michigan involves three people, Lance, David, and a person named Mark Zavaya. They are up and running in Michigan now, harvesting their facilities. And they've also launched their brand, Golden State Exotics. Like I asked at the beginning of the video, how many times would you start over? How many times would you be able to rebuild something that you spent years on, only to have it demolished in front of you? It's easier said than done, but the right answer is, I'll get back up and try again, and again, and as many goddamn times as I need to. The story of Lance is a story of never giving up. For God's sakes, being shot, almost spending 20 years in jail. But the point is, Lance never gave up. Lance went down so many different paths, only to have each of those pathways cave in, forcing him to turn back. And instead of just giving up, he forged new pathways, which in many ways led him to innovate new business ventures, like for example, the whip kits, the Patreon consulting, and many other unique business avenues. After talking with Lance for countless hours, I think that he has realized a couple years ago, right when he started the Craft Farmer brand, that his pathway to success was going to be built on helping others succeed, providing true value to growers, whether it be innovative products or knowledge and education. And over the past couple years, Lance has stacked all of these different offerings and leveraged them into other major business opportunities. For all of the small business owners and aspiring cannabis entrepreneurs listening, I want y'all to remember that everyone has a different design for their success. And while you can have a plan to reach that success, more likely than not, you're going to have to adapt, to pivot, to make changes to that plan and find a new pathway to that success. Because most likely, things aren't gonna go as planned. In many ways, the design for your success won't be fully understood until you reach it. Life, business, really anything is about never giving up, adapting to roadblocks, finding solutions, and then reflecting on those solutions to fully understand the design of your success. So that in the hopes on your next journey up to the next level in whatever you want to achieve, it may be a little easier to reach and over time trust me it will pay off thank you so much for watching this episode of high design big shouts out to lance and the whole craft farmer team the future well it's looking very bright for them please make sure to hit the like button subscribe comment share this video and check all the links down below in the description and follow me on all the socials this is lmc signing out Hey, waiting to get right, only leave you left behind. Up goes the early bird, soaring down. Scrounge around for whatever words might be obtainable. Never knew who flew about theirs first. So what's available, not a lot, it seems. What you gonna do for it? Anything I means? Type of dedication you gotta have as you're blazing the path. Never know who's trailing you, hoping to get familiar with the ways of the things that we do. Bought hard and hold everyone who here accountable. Speaking up, stack it up till it's high as the stars in the skies. Always told to shine bright. You see it in my eyes. Who we found high among the low. Yeah. Ain't no stopping in, so we don't go. There's no slowing down, no, not right now. Cause the ways of the things that we do. Bought hard and hold everyone who Speaking up, stack it up till it's high as the stars in the skies. Always told to shine bright.